Okay, chemistry students, today we're going to learn about molecular geometry. Now last uh, couple of videos we were talking about Lewis structures. And uh, what do they not tell us? Well, they don't tell us the shape of the molecule. And that's what you're going to learn today. So why do molecules take specific shapes? They do it to minimize electron repulsion. Now we're going to talk about Vesper theory, and I am going to let a chemist from UT Austin explain Vesper theory to you, because he does a great job. After you've mastered how to write electron dot formulas on a piece of paper, which is a flat sheet and we're kind of limited to the two-dimensional world, you have to really start thinking about how molecules really look in a three-dimensional world, because that's the world that molecules actually live in. The simplest model for modeling this type of behavior, and it actually works rather well, is called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And the name's probably scarier than it actually is as far as it works. We often just call it the VSEPR theory, and then we kind of just say it all together, Vesper theory. So you'll hear me say Vesper theory from now on when I mean the previous. So the way it works, and the name kind of gives it away, is you take your electron dot formula and you simply count electron regions around the central atom, and you realize that each of those regions is a negatively charged region. And so it's going to repulse all the other negatively charged regions, and they're going to try to get away from each other. They can't completely get away, though, because the nucleus of the central atom is holding them in. So what they do is they try to get away from each other, but they're still held by the central atom. This leads to distinct molecular shapes. And the easiest one is two regions. If you only have one atom on one side and one on the other, and they try to get away from each other, you get a fairly linear type um, molecule. And so that's the first one. Two regions gives you linear shape. The bond angle is 180. Stepping up to the next one, three regions. You count the regions around the central, there's three. If three regions try to get away from each other, you basically get a nice kind of pie shape. It's like taking a pie and cutting it into perfect thirds. So you get a 120 degree angle all the way around for those three regions. Both of those regions are still planar. They still look just fine on a sheet of paper. It's when you get to four regions that you have to go to the third dimension. You have to go three-dimensional. And what this gets you is a shape that we call a tetrahedron or tetrahedral geometry. It's four regions around a central, all perfectly symmetric. And if you take a look and spin the molecule around and look at it, every region is equivalent. And the bond angles are now down to 109.5 degrees. That's a tetrahedral geometry. So as you can see, the bond angles are getting smaller because we're bringing in more regions. We started at 180 for linear, 120 for trigonal planar. Now we're down to 109.5 for tetrahedral. So that really sums up most of what we will use, especially in organic chemistry. And that is at the heart of Vesper theory. Okay, now that you have a little background on Vesper, Vesper theory and um, electron repulsion, we're going to go through some details here. Okay, you've already talked about valence shell electron pair repulsion, and that is used to predict the shape of individual molecules based upon the extent of electron pair repulsion. You're going to want to know this definition is on the test. And we get our Vesper right here uh, by the VSE. P, R. There are two types of electron sets that must be considered. The first one is that electrons can exist in bonding pairs, which we already know about. Those are the pairs that are, that are shared between two atoms. And they are involved in creating a single or multiple, which are double and triple, covalent bond. Or... The second type are the non-bonding pairs, are the lone pairs, the pairs of electrons that are not involved in a, in a bond. Those are usually the ones that are on an atom that, uh, that are not shared at all. 
These non-bonding electrons also play an important role in the shape of a molecule. Now we have a method, and it's called the AXE method, the A-X-E, for determining structure. It's a really easy method once you get the hang of it. The first one, the letter A, that represents the central atom. Usually, there's only one of that atom. If there are three or more atoms in a compound, then the central atom is always carbon, if carbon is in this compound, or it is the least electronegative atom. So remember your electronegativity trends, guys. It looks like this if your periodic table, your electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right, and we do not include noble gases, but you don't have to worry about the noble gases because you're not gonna see those in a compound. And it is never hydrogen. So let's take our example of carbon dioxide, CO2. So what would be the central atom? Well, here it's carbon, because it says right here it's always carbon. The second step is the X. And that subscript on the X represents the number of atoms bonded to the central atom. So on our example of carbon dioxide, our A represents carbon, our A represents carbon, our X represents the, the number of atoms that are bonded to the central atom. So carbon's our central atom, and we have two oxygens bonded to it. So X would be two, and that would look like a subscript. X sub two. Step three is E, and that represents the subscript to E, represents the number of lone pairs of electrons surrounding the central atom. So in order to find this out, carbon, we have to write our Lewis dot structure for carbon. And uh, it has four valence shell electrons, and they happen to be bonded with oxygen. All right, this is our covalent structure for carbon dioxide. And if you remember correctly, these, if you remember correctly, these bonds we denoted with a line. If you notice, carbon has no lone pairs of electrons. There are none. All of carbon's uh, electrons are being bonded. All of carbon's electrons are shared in a bond with oxygen. Oxygen has lone pairs, but the E stands for only the central atom right here, only the lone pairs on the central atom, so we don't count these. So our E subscript should be zero. All right, now how we do this, you're, you're gonna need to look at your chart. I believe it is the page after the third page on your notes. Uh, and it looks like this right here, uh, like this chart. Okay, so right up here, it says the total number is equal to the atoms, which is X, plus the lone pairs around a central atom. So we're taking this subscript plus this subscript, and it would be two. Two plus zero is two. So we're gonna look right, I'll look right here. And we only have one choice, and that is linear. So our molecule would, for carbon dioxide is linear. And if you notice right here, A, X sub two, E sub zero, which is what our formula is right here. A, X sub two, E sub zero. All right, let's do one more example. We have HF. So there uh, is no central atom because there's one of both and hydrogen is never ever considered a central atom. If there's no central atom right here, it's pretty easy. We got linear. So HF, is linear. We do not have to do any electron dot configurations for hydrogen fluoride. Okay, now we're going to do BF3. Our central atom would be boron. So let's write boron. Boron is in group 13, which means it has three valence shell electrons. So I'm going to write three valence shell electrons. Fluorine is in group 17, and there are three of them, which means it has seven valence shell electrons. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It shares one with boron. We're going to do another one over here. One, two, five, six, seven. And one last one over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now remember our shared pairs we denote with a line. Let's do our AXE. Our A is boron. Our X is the number of atoms bonded to our central atom, and there are three, so we're going to do a subscript of three. And our last one is E, which is the number of lone pairs on our central atom. Well, we've drawn our Lewis dot structure, and there are no non-bonding pairs on boron. All of boron's electrons are being bonded, so that would be A, X, 3, E, 0. So our next step is we need to add up our um, X's and our E's. So 3 plus 0 is 3. So we're going to be looking in this row. Okay? Uh, now how to do this. Trigonal planar, by the way, this yellow right here means it's a lone pair. And boron has no lone pairs here, so it has to be trigonal planar. It is AX3E0. If it were AX2E1, it would be this one bent. That stands for a lone pair. But ours, uh, uh, boron is, the boron tetrafluoride is trigonal planar. Okay. F4. Our A is carbon. Okay. Our X, we have, is the number of atoms bonded to carbon. We have four. So it's going to be AX sub four. And our E, our subscript, is going to be how many lone pairs carbon has. So we need to draw the Lewis dot structure for this. Carbon is in group 14, which means it has four valence shell electrons. Fluorine is in group 17, which means it has seven valence shell electrons. And it wants one more, so it's going to borrow one from carbon. I'm going to go ahead and write all these down. You should know this by now. And it shares one. And we have four of them, so they all look the same. Now remember our bonded pairs, we always connect with a line for each pair that is shared. And if you notice, carbon's electrons are all bonded. There are no pairs that are not bonded. So that means E has a sub-zero. Next step, we need to add these up. We need to add up our subscripts on our X's and our E's, which is four and zero. Four plus zero is four. So we are going to look in this row. Now our AX4E0 is tetrahedral. Molecular shape is for CF4 is tetrahedral. Next example. Our A here is never hydrogen, so we can mark that out, which leaves oxygen. Our central atom is oxygen. Our X is the number of atoms that are bonded to oxygen. If you look right here, it's two hydrogens, so it's X sub two. And E is the number of lone pairs on our oxygen. So we need to draw a Lewis dot structure for H2O. All right, our oxygen is in the middle, so we are going to, and it has six valence shell electrons because it's in group 16. So I'm gonna draw the six valence shell electrons. We have two hydrogens, and they each have one valence shell electron. They want one more, so they're going to borrow one from hydrogen. So I'm going to put one on each side. Remember, we denote our shared pairs with a white line. If you notice on our central atom, we now have two pairs of electrons that are not bonded. These are two lone pairs. So our E is now, it now has a sub-zero. These are non-bonding pairs. of electrons. Okay, so we need to add up our X's and our E's, our subscripts. So we've got E2 and X2, so 2 plus 2 is 4, so we are going to look in this column right here. Okay, 
And uh, if you look, it's not a x4 e0. We have a x2 e2. So we move on down. That would be right here. And it is called bent. Now I want you to see something here. We have two lone pairs. These yellow half dumbbells, these little half dumbbell shapes here are lone pairs if they're yellow. If they're white, that means it's bonded to an atom. So it appears that it's the correct thing. We have two lone pairs and we have two hydrogens. Now that we know H2O is a bent tetrahedral shape, we need to redraw Lewis structure compound. So oxygen is bent with its lone pairs up at the top, because right over here we have our lone pairs up at the top, and our hydrogens are in a bent shape at the bottom. Right here, bent shape at the bottom. Now I would like for you to take a moment and practice on the next eight problems and then come back and check.